Okay, um, hello. Uh, today I'm talking about track cap. Oh, I see there's some shift in the video. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, should, should still work. So um, this is a system which converts a typical smartphone into a 3D tracked controller for augmented reality. Uh, there's a short video uh, showing the system, so you can. So here's the phone. You have a slight offset and lag due, due to the recording, but what you can see is you can hold the device outside the field of view of the uh, HMD, which in this case is a Hololens, <laughs> and you can use it as a 360F uh, controller. And what it can also do, it can use the high definition screen of the smartphone as an interaction space, so you have haptic feedback and everything. So, what are the advantages? So, we have, of course, 60 of tracking, and we also, unlike most controllers, uh, have a touch screen. Uh, in, in addition to, of course, uh, getting some haptic feedback from the device, and also the interesting part is that we have no computational overload by using this uh, device, because if you take a look at it, um, the operation principle is that the smartphone itself is able to track itself relative to the HMD. So while this, the phone itself has no world knowledge, the HMD usually has. So in this case, um, we use the front camera of the smartphone to track a planar marker on the HMD, which is essentially a piece of paper uh, on a stable surface and uh, which is simply rigidly mounted on any HMD. So it must not be a HoloLens. It, can, it doesn't need to be a HoloLens. It is uh, possible to attach this to any kind of HMD. And as I said, the phone itself tracks uh, its pose and sends that to the HMD using some wireless networks. We can use Bluetooth or uh, Wi-Fi in this case. And from there, um, the phone can place itself in, in the world. So you have, like you would see in a, in a Vive tracking, for example, if, uh, or, or some mixed reality tracking from Microsoft. So uh, how does it look from outside? So it's an essentially outside-in tracking. So we, have, we, we are not dependent on the system of the HMD itself. So it's, uh, everything runs on the mobile phone. And as you can see, most HMDs have some kind of forward-facing camera, like in this case the HoloLens, or they might not have any cameras at all. Uh, for example, oh, well, they have cameras, but if you take a look at the um, Google Cardboard, then it's always forward-looking or no cameras. And here you can see that the frontal camera of the smartphone usually sees the HMD. So even if you hold it at hip level, which is convenient, and this allows you to interact with the scene. If you wanted to track from the HMD, you would have to hold it like in front of your face, and this doesn't help. Oh. <clears throat> so, um, so we designed uh, some 3D printable uh, mounts, which allowed us to attach a marker to various kinds of HMDs. So on the bottom, you see that for Daydream, Google Daydream, and different types of mounts for the HoloLens. And we also tried it on, on VR headsets like the Vive, just to have a comparison. Uh, and we also tried different shapes of the marker itself. So here you can see it's kind of oddly shaped to avoid the HoloLens tracking the marker with, with the environment tracking. But it does not really have a great impact on the, on the performance, so you can shape it any way you want, actually. Um, so, and what we noticed, for example, that in the way this, is, uh, this device is operated, it's, uh, the camera is facing upwards. And usually on the ceiling, you have some ceiling lights or the sky, which uh, can present some challenging uh, lighting situations for the feature tracking. So we experimented and have a, now an actively lit marker, which helps to compensate for that a little. And if you have extremely challenging situations, this, of course, improves the robustness, but it's not, it, it adds a bit of um, uh, effort to the marker, so it's not entirely necessary to do that, but we found it helpful. Okay, so um, having that system, we started some experiments and wanted to see how our uh, 
track it, uh, track the controller behaves compared to uh, other existing solutions. So, in most cases, the existing solutions cons uh, for simple HMDs consist of a 3D or F track controller <coughs> only. Like, for example, Daydream, you have just rotation, uh, which are useful, but not for everything, and they tend to drift, so you have to reset them at some point. So we put this to a test, and so here you can see a very small inset video, a simple raycast to select some distant object. Um, we and uh, this was arranged so that the user had to turn around uh, and kick on, uh, I think, 21 spheres uh, with some guidance. And we wanted to see if TrackCap is faster or TrackCap has less error than an IMU-only uh, controller. So we emulated both on the phone in this case, so the user did not have to switch uh, the system. Um, what we could see from that is that the error rate indeed was much better using TrackCap. So TrackCap essentially eliminates drift in this use case. Um, what we did not see is that it is faster, so there were no significant distances, uh, differences, so we uh, scrapped that hypothesis and accept H2. Um, now for the interesting part, um, having a six degrees of freedom tracked controller uh, enables you to do some close proximity selection, so if you have your, for example, a Vive controller, you can do stuff in a desktop environment, and using Holocap, you can do exactly that, so I'm playing some video, so you can just see this is a selection only. Uh, can I repeat that? That's a bit short. So. Okay. Uh, so you just hold your phone next to the object you want to select and you, you can use that. Um, again, we wanted to see if TrackCap is indeed faster by selecting objects in close proximity or it has a less uh, an error rate, which is less. Uh, we can say that the error rate is significantly lower with the direct selection, so using TrackCap, mainly because um, three degrees of freedom on the controller is yeah, not so not so natural in a close in, in a close proximity. Okay, so now another interesting part is uh, object manipulation. So how um, would we go about grabbing an object? and directly moving it somewhere else and also changing the orientation and everything, so, place, so placing objects and aligning objects. Uh, we also compared it to um, IMU-based version only, which is essentially, as you can see in the top, uh, a fishing rod metaphor. I've seen a talk on Tuesday, I think, which was similar. Uh, it was Ray Cursor, I think, um, which is an interesting technique. So we implemented that um, and compared it to direct manipulation using grab cap where you simply grab an object, move it somewhere and use your controller to place it. On, in this case, in, you can see in the bottom there's a, a, a target quad where you have to put the, uh, the object on top. Uh, I have some short videos about that. So they are, on the top you see the direct manipulation and on the bottom you see that the, the rotation in this case in the fishing rod metaphor is uh, decoupled from the positioning. So positioning in uh, the depth is done using the touch screen of the phone. Both approaches worked quite well. So, um, but we again uh, wanted to see if track is faster or has less error or and has less error. Um, what we could see in this case that using the track cap system users were significantly faster but the error rate was, uh, so error was position and rotation in this case, uh, target or rotation. Uh, they were quite similar because uh, users had a visual feedback and just spent more time aligning the, the, the object. But it was, uh, they stated it was not entirely natural using that the fishing rods. That was something we learned from that. Um, then we wanted to extend the tracking space. so. Uh, if you've seen the previous images, uh, the front camera might not always face the HMD, so one would lose the positional tracking. And if you would do like a 180 degree turn, uh, you wouldn't see any HMD at all. So we implemented a system which uses both cameras of this smartphone 
and did some dynamic switching in between because we were limited by the devices and couldn't turn on both cameras at the same time. So that uh, we implemented a wire, a virtual wire game. So this is seen through the HoloLens, and you have your phone and are manipulating this uh, uh, ring. So I don't know if you know these wire games. <laughs> so which requires the user to rotate the, the phone quite often. Uh, the problem um, is here that the switching time between the frontal and the back was facing camera was uh, too long, so that took about a second, which um, uh, stopped us from performing the entire experiment. We stopped after eight uses because it was not really feasible. Um, but looking at the problem, we extended the system to use also a SLAM system. In this case, we used uh, Tango. Uh, but now, nowadays, you would use Air Core for that. Um, and we implemented a Pong game, uh, which can be seen here. Uh, so this game is mainly used for uh, requiring the user to do wide movements and fast movements and a lot of rotations. So very, it's very demanding for, for any, any tracking system. And what we wanted to show, if, if we use some um, a SLAM-only system, it would, would also drift at some point because you have really a lot of action going on. Um, in this case, we uh, state that uh, the task completion time would be similar, so hit all these balls in, in the correct order uh, because the balls were flying, flying at a uh, constant rate. But uh, the track cap augmented slam should have a much better success rate because of the elimination of drift at all. Um, and you could uh, clearly show that. So the success rate was much higher using the slam and track cap combination uh, because uh, at, some, at some point the the drift using SLAM only was uh, too large and users had to reset the position to even see the pedal anymore. Okay, so as a summary, um, we can say that track cap enables a natural interaction because it's a six degrees of freedom uh, controller and uh, we, can out, uh, we can overcome the space limitations uh, by using a SLAM system and combine it with track cap. And this benefits from each other because using the track cap, uh, you could always absolutely align your uh, SLAM system with your reference coordinate system, like the HMD in this case. Okay, so of course uh, our experiments were a bit limited. We did not really show uh, or did any experiments on how users would interact more complex on the touch screen. So with the Hololens, you can you have a see-through display and you can do more, of course, on the screen, but we did not uh, have any experience for that. We just uh, focused on uh, the, the spatial component. Okay, so what could we do with that? Um, so here you can see uh, the first implementation of a uh, track cap uh, augmented uh, Nerf gun. So it has a Bluetooth trigger and we built a little uh, uh, augmented reality shooter with that. And what's nice about it, you have uh, really an uh, interactive screen on, on your properties. So it uh, could be used for any similar to our, uh, this Vive track attachments, but this was interactive and you can more or less connect it to any HMT if you want. And of course, for more serious uh, uh, things, you could use it to track some kind of tools which are used in repair tasks, so like uh, multimeters or something like this. Um, what we also explored a little bit, we did no studies for that, um, is you could have some kind of gestures on the, on the smartphone screen. So if you're full six inch, I don't know what, uh, smartphone screen, and you can do all the gestures you mainly do on a smartphone screen, but you now have also have uh, six degrees of freedom tracking doing that. So in, in this case, we um, tested it in some kind of dragon shooting game, and you could swipe on your phone and shoot fireballs in the direction you were swiping. And this was world registered because the phone itself was also tracked. Um, that was quite fun. <laughs> and of course, uh, you've seen the first video. We uh, implemented a, more or less a mock-up application where you have some kind of overview and detailed metaphors because not all of the information uh, 
should be shown in AR. So some information is much more is better viewed on a high density screen like the smartphone. In this example, you would have you know a floor plan, for example, which you could scroll. You could show that in AR, but some some things are just better on a smartphone. Uh, for example, filling out an order form. So I don't know if you have a Hololens and you start clicking your email address. This is uh, <laughs> takes some time. So for that, the smartphone is much better. Um, so, concludingly, um, what we can say is that TrackCap is, in, of course, not proprietary, so you can add it to any HMD, even really cheap ones, like a, a cardboard, and you can freely program the controller, so you have an entire high-definition screen to do anything you want, and it really works with VR devices, it works with AR devices, so that is pretty nice. And of course, we showed that it is sufficient for natural interaction, like uh, close proximity grabbing and manipulation of objects. Um, for future work, um, we of course want to take a look at the using the touch screen, touch screen in augmented reality, and also what kind of haptic feedback we can render on that, and how the, the high definition screen could work out. Uh, of course, we could do some kind of um, collaborative activities because uh, since each controller is a self-contained unit, it can you know, even be handed to someone else with another track cap and it would just register to that HMD because you can identify the marker. And of course you can have multiple controllers for each person because all the processing is happening on the device, so you have no impact on your HMD system. Um, of course, um, one could use wide-angle lenses for the smartphone to just increase the tracking range. And in the end, we just want to remove the cap itself because uh, we could figure out a way to track the HMD itself. So that should be possible. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Fabrice Mitchellik, <coughs> Preferred Networks. Um, so in the literature of um, distant pointing and ray casting for wall displays, there are lots of techniques that use the phone, you know, to point at displays, yeah. and, and they use the touch screen to control the cursor using I mean, direct pointing or adapting the CD gain. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as I understand, you're not really using the touch screen to sort of control the, the pointing direction, right, for your targeting yes, task, yes. right? So I was wondering if using your, your application, you could use the uh, sort of general direction of the, of the phone and then sort of fine grain uh, cursor control for smaller targets in your, uh, in your technique. So I, maybe you were trying to hint at that with your um, directional swiping gestures? Yes, more or less. So um, of course, it's a, well, it's a very good idea to just go in a fast motion to some position and then use some fine grains yeah. Even, you could even rotate the phone and use the 2D screen to you and you know, can use change the, the plane of interaction. You can use this, the, the mm -hmm. thumb also for your Z control, like yeah. depth mm -hmm. control. So, yeah, maybe it's worth considering. Yeah, definitely possible. So we did not look into that, but that would maybe in the, fu be in the future work. Yeah, very good suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> so here you can see the swiping game. <laughs> So I'm wondering a little bit about what um, you said the switching between the front camera and the back camera had a one second delay? Yes. Yeah, so is it because of the device you were using? Yeah. Or? Yes, okay. so it's maybe not the, the, just the device, but uh, we used Android devices. Mm -hmm. And so in, in that generation of Android devices, the, the switching, so activating one, or deactivating one camera and switching to the other one took uh, uh, quite an amount of time. Yeah. So there are some phones which uh, are able to simultaneously run both cameras, but there are not so many of those, and the API was not standardized. So, for example, if you have a Samsung phone, you would need their API key to do that, right. which yes. we didn't have. But things are getting better, I think. So um, using, for example, AR Core or AR Kit devices, mm -hmm. like uh, the Apple things, this could be po uh, possible just using the slam and using relocalization using the marker. So maybe the switching will not be necessary anyways. Cool. So any questions? Any more questions? 
Well, if not, then please just thank all our speakers again. And I believe there will be...